tonight I get to interview um, a very good, interesting, I have to say so many things about this man. I mean, I, I don't even know where to begin. Um, it's an honor to sit here uh, next to Mr. Griffiths, uh, Arthur. Um, I, have, uh, I have for many years known about his work, uh, followed who he was um, and who he is, and more recently gotten to know him as a person. And uh, very approachable man, uh, very interesting man, and uh, uh, thank you for being here with me. My pleasure. Thank you. So um, what I, how I conduct my interviews is uh, I don't really set questions. I base everything, my work, on curiosity. I, I try to take um, the thoughts that I have and uh, try to convey them into questions and conversation. And uh, tonight will be one of those conversations. So uh, I thank you again for being here. And uh, we'll start. Um, so Arthur, let's, let's start from the beginning. Where were you born and uh, where are you from? I was born in Vancouver, BC. Okay. In fact, I uh, was born at uh, VGH because Lionsgate Hospital wasn't open yet. <laughs> yeah. It goes back that far, yeah. uh, if you want to get my uh, age out of the way, it was 56. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, family's Vancouver, grandfather, uh, or uh, my father yeah. uh, as well, and uh, so, and my mother, of course, so yeah. it's, uh, this is home. It's, uh, so the Griffiths family, I mean, there's, uh, let's, let's start with your grandfather and your father. Um, tell us a bit of the background, uh, business and life, and where they came from. Well, my father, uh, my father's father, that is, and mother, uh, grandmother, sorry, came from England, uh, and he decided this was a little better lifestyle than uh, middle of England in the, in the late 1800s. So uh, he uh, moved here, and eventually my father was born here. So, but they they were um, uh, they were classic. Uh, even what he did as a career before he came to Canada, my grandfather was a um, was an accountant. Uh, he worked on the ships as a purser. So he decided that he was going to get his Institute of British Columbia uh, certificate as a CA. Uh, had a son yeah. and decided it was a good idea to follow in his father's footsteps. They had a company for many, many years, for gosh, probably 30 years. Uh, uh, they, they were quite creative. I uh, came up with the name Griffiths and Griffiths. And uh, they, they had a, a nice little office that was very conveniently located. If you can appreciate the business back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, directly across the street from the Vancouver Club. So many of their clients were just sort of coming and going from the Vancouver Club and doing business, so it was a good way to trap people there on the golf course, I guess. And then my mother, which is, which, which is uh, some people know the story, but my mother was um, originally born in Saskatchewan, but moved here in the, when she was about 18 That's months right. old, and she's, uh, she had, she, she's got a wonderful story in her own right. Uh, her father was a, uh, a real pioneer uh, in the sense of business. Uh, he was a veterinarian from Ontario. Uh, Dr. Ballard was his name. Uh, right. He decided to create a dog food empire, which he did. Yeah. And uh, for most of the people, well, a number of the people in this room, they have never heard of him, but uh, he was the first to can dog food. He was the first to create a biscuit that a dog would chew because Do you guys it was, know Dr. Ballard's? Yeah, so, I definitely people, do. I people. definitely heard of it. Yeah. So, yeah, so those are my, uh, my parents and grandparents' yeah. uh, beginnings, if you will. And so when you were growing up, siblings? Mm -hmm. Uh, one older brother, yeah. older sister, and a younger sister. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we're all still around. So you're, I mean, you're a quintessential entrepreneur. I do know that about you. So were you entrepreneurial when you were younger? <laughs> Absolutely. Talk about some of your first jobs and tell me how old you were. Yeah. I guess my first job was probably, uh, first of all, I, I, I've, always, I've always liked to work. Uh, I, I don't care what it was. I don't care if it was, um, you know, uh, mowing the lawn or, 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 or painting the boat or or cleaning the boat or the mm -hmm. car, whatever. So when I was about 14, I guess my first job was, believe it or not, was uh, working in the kitchen at a fishing lodge up the coast. Uh, and then eventually I became a fishing guide uh, because I grew up on the water, essentially, on these, this ocean here. Yeah. So I, uh, and then I eventually, uh, my first sort of job that, that paid reasonably well, I think it was well underpaid, but it, it was paid reasonably well. I was. I went to win standards, Arthur. <laughs> yeah. Reasonably well. Well, yeah, yeah, I go. went to a. Uh, I, I I thought I, I could have done better, but uh, it was a family business, so there was a way to keep the uh, keep the pay low. Um, I worked for a radio station that we were part of, 
in our business, and that was in Winnipeg. So I worked in Winnipeg for a summer and then here. Let's talk about the media business and mm. uh, segue about the family business. Uh, as far as media, how did that start? Because we, we talked about accounting, but yeah. there's a media side uh, to it, You know, it, it, it goes to show you that uh, whether, whether you're lawyers, accountants, and others um, with an with a educational background, my father was a classic entrepreneur in that regard. He uh, he saw opportunity that many people uh, never did, and or if they did, it was usually too late. Um, so he, in the 1950s, um, decided that there was a, a business that was attractive to him, and one's the one that he understood the numbers as an accountant. And so he bought a radio station. It's referred to by some, um, not as many as it used to be, but the Giant 98. So CKNW was uh, bought in 1957, yeah. then CFMI, and then he grew the business over the next 40 years to be at the, uh, when my mother, uh, my father passed away 20 years ago, yeah. but when my mother uh, ultimately sold the business in 2000, uh, it was the largest broadcasting company in the country, radio and television. So it was a really fascinating upbringing. I worked in the business for a while, and so it was a really, uh, you know, the, the characters that are in this city, yeah. in the media business. Um, <laughs> yep. Such crazy people. Yeah. I've, yeah. I've heard. Yeah. The, the evolution, the politics, the CRTC. Yeah. What a what a what an interesting education that was. Did, now let's talk education. Um, did you go, were you going to school? Did you go to school and what did you take and what, what were your focuses when you were going to academia? Well, it, initially I was just I think I was uh, attracted to sales and marketing, so I took sales yeah. and marketing at uh, at uh, Capilano, and I just couldn't wait to work. I just couldn't yeah. wait to get into a job uh, and uh, and get paid. Um, so uh, again, an entrepreneur. Um, yeah. So I. Uh, but then I finished my first two years, and my father says to me, you know, I don't think you've got enough of an accounting background. Of course, he would say that. And I said, well, what do you mean? And he goes, well, I think you should get some accounting. You should maybe be an accountant. And I said, <laughs> I didn't say it to him, but of course, there's, there's no way I was going to do that. Um, so I decided that I would go to BCIT, and I did a finance degree there. Um, that seemed to make him happy for a while. And uh, so that was my, my sort of education, but clearly, um, as, as people, uh, everybody experiences this, your real education is actually once you leave school. Yeah. Right? It's what you do with it, more importantly, what your instincts are, your passions are. So that's where I kind of got my education, still do. Wow. There's, there's, um, there's a saying about uh, a path that is chosen by somebody and, uh, and something that's already chosen for you. Mm -hmm. um, you had a family influence, mm -hmm. family business, done well. Um, so you could have taken a path that was sort of given to you, mm. and then, or the other committed path that you chose. And, and let's talk a little bit about that. Well, frankly, within the family business, there was obviously there was uh, besides the, the media, we had the we had a fairly reasonably well-known sports team. Um, yeah, we'll talk about that too. Um, and so after I left uh, the radio business, uh, after a few years uh, and graduated, I. Uh, my father said to me, what would you like to do? And he says, well, what business? And I said, well, to be honest with you, I, I really I really like the uh, the um, the sports. And he goes, oh, no, 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 no. no. He's, well, I said, I don't want to do radio. I've done that. And I don't really think that that's where I want to be. And then he goes, well, okay, well, what about TV? And I said, mm, well, okay, but I still like the sports. And he goes, he goes, okay. So, any event, I, uh, I got a sales and marketing job uh, uh, in the Vancouver Canucks in about 1980 and uh, and I um, that meant all kinds of different things it meant listening to abusive people say uh, when I asked them for their money for their season's tickets not knowing it was me although a few people figured that out uh, saying whoa just the ears would just burn um, including people wanting to give me extra cash because they wanted better seats. I said, there's no way. Can you still get seats? <laughs> I don't know. I was, pay for I, them. I was, pay somebody for told them. me to ask you that. Yeah, I do pay for them. Uh, my mother, actually. Today. My mother pays for them. There we go. She has a, okay. she, she's, God bless her, she has, still has a suite. And uh, uh, I'm going to say this forever, by the way, for the record, General Motors Place. Um, yeah, that's right. That's right. Nothing against Rogers. Just, nothing. Uh, nothing. It's just, uh, of course not. Uh, they were pretty good to us. So, uh, yeah. no, so I... Uh, I have a I have a uh, access, and uh, in fact, I was negotiating with her for some certain tickets for this year. So, okay, November second. <coughs> yeah. I. Uh, so with with a successful um, idea of going into the sports arena, where do you go from saying, okay, I'm going to get a, 
a, I'm gonna have a job, whether it's salary, commission, to say, I'm gonna buy a team, and I want to know how much that costs, and how do you how do you justify, um, in your own <laughs> mind, and to your dad and to whoever, like, m m like, where did that where did, where did that happen? How did you do that? Well, in the in the uh, in the uh, early days when my father owned the team, it was a it was a very very um, small budget, relatively speaking, of course. In fact, I think our first payroll is probably what one hockey player or a few hockey players will make this year on the team. Um, that said, um, it, it was a it was a, it was not bad decision yeah. on the business side because, frankly, when you have the media properties, so you got a radio station that carried the Canucks right. and so on, and then there's the TV. So those are sort of natural synergies in business, but uh, but um, there's it, they're, they don't operate like normal businesses. Sports teams typically, until more recently, do not operate like a normal business in terms of why you make the decision, uh, you know, the, the dispassionate decision that comes from owning a sports team doesn't exist. It's, it's, all, it's all heart and soul and passion. Of and, course. And uh, you live and breathe it and you get the good with the bad and so on. So it was really something that just, I just loved the idea. I loved the, uh, the connectivity to the community. I loved what it, I, I loved how, and I love how uh, uh, a sports team, any sports team, can take a city to a new place and it can take it in a good way uh, when you, the, audi the odd incident, uh, obviously, but when you think about what a team can do when people are excited sure. and, and whatever else is in your day, you forget it. Whether it's in the, in the restaurant or the bar or at lunch or in the coffee room or whatever it is, you've suddenly got this interest that's, that's sort of, you, you gather around. And look, here are the Canucks at training camp today. And you would think that it's mid-season. People are just going crazy. I feel sad for some of the other sports teams right now because it's going to be tough to grab the line right back. Let's talk about other sports teams. <laughs> Let's segue to that. Uh, All right. Uh, with, with, with good comes bad and then interesting new things. So did you know that you were going to get a basketball team as well? Well, what I did know is that I was going to go on uh, the greatest ride and out on the biggest limb of my life. Yeah. And that was to, was to take... Uh, and take the opportunity to put the Canucks in the right place for the long term. And that meant moving from the current building, which is the City Coliseum. Mm -hmm. The only way the Canucks are here today, uh, in, in reality, and surviving, and thriving financially, is because there's a new building. That new building uh, was privately financed. In yeah. fact, the last building at, after, which was in 95, we opened, the last time there was a building financed prior to that was 60 years earlier. Wow. So the bottom line was, though, Vancouver needed a new home uh, for the team. Uh, we could not stay. It wasn't, it wasn't just the building. It was the location. Yeah. And don't let anybody tell you, and I can give you lots of examples. I could, this, is, this is, you think I had a radio show. Um, this, this, this is important to note when you build a team. You've got to have the building in the location where the people live and work, predominantly where they work and hopefully where they live. So location is important. And so downtown Vancouver was where it was going to be. I then decided, and this is where it gets interesting, I said, you know, one team is nice, but I think, I think Vancouver's grown up. I think yeah. we're ready. We're ready for the NBA. And this is, I'm glad we got this opportunity to talk about the NBA for a minute because it is not what people think. I can tell you what it, what it is. The NBA granted this team to this city they handcuffed the team on a number of levels. They had a, what they call an expansion agreement. Um, typically an expansion agreement is just when you pay and how much. <laughs> Not in this case. The NBA decided that they were going to learn from their previous expansion where they were not going to allow a team to get successful. Sounds crazy. Too quickly. Because the previous expansion, there was the one team called the Orlando Magic yeah. who went from non-existence to three championships in about six years. And the owners who were quite uh, resentful said, we're not going to do that again, but we're going to charge more money and we're going to make sure that those new teams cannot spend to the cap, which means you can't acquire the best talent. Secondly, you can't even acquire the best talent in the draft, which is the only way to build in the NBA, because the reality is, is they didn't want you to go out and get the next uh, you know, Michael Jordan or whoever it might be. So you had to Wait. So we, it took us five years. Yeah. So it was, it was sort of like having two, two arms tied behind your back. 
Um, so that said, we still had a fan base, a great fan base. Yeah. We had 12,500 people per night, guaranteed. Some nights we were 18, 19, 20, 000, or 18,000. And I, I tell you, uh, the, that was the least of the Vancouver Grizzlies' problem. What happened is when I sold everything, um, it, what I did was um, my partner decided that there was an opportunity to, uh, which was his right, to sell the team and make money. So yeah. he sold and pocketed quite a lot of money within a, six years. So he sold the team, decided it was, uh, he wanted only one team, and that was, his, that was up to him to do. But uh, it wasn't what people thought. Vancouver was fine. In fact, true be known, 90... 96, 97, and 98, the team that lost lots of money was the Canucks. The Grizzlies lost two, three million a year versus 15 or 18 or 19 million for the Canucks per year. So it was a nightmare. And, we, and, and, and remembering in hockey and in basketball in that mid-90s, there were lockouts and strikes. So there was always this start, stop, start, stop. And in the, in the early days in sport, it was in the 90s, nobody planned financially what you do if there's a work stoppage. The NHL, I think, has perfected it, um, sadly, but in one sense it's pretty shrewd, is they've said, we have a game plan, we have a battle plan. If we go to war, we're going to win, and we're going to win on every level. We're going to win financially, we're going to make sure that we don't spend to oblivion, and more importantly, we're not going to um, be obligated with expenses when the business is stopped. And that's what they've done, and been successful at it. Did you pay attention more to the hockey or the basketball? Obviously the hockey, for sure. Yeah. I mean, they, they kind of drive me crazy yeah. being living in London for the last Drives few... Drives them crazy too, right guys? <laughs> well, at 3 and 4 in the morning when the game starts in London, yeah. when I've been living there, it, yeah. uh, it, was, uh, it was, you know, I somebody dragged myself out of bed in the morning going, oh God, I <laughs> oh, another shootout? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I mean, from, from business to business, um, how do you decide what's successful and what's not going to be successful? And, and do you like, are you are you are you are you projecting numbers, or do you just say like, you know what, this hockey's pretty popular. Um, it's it's we have a huge opportunity here. Um, we have we have the means to finance this. Mm -hmm. Let's go for it. Yeah, there, there's no question that there was there was this recognition that Vancouver, Vancouver's identity. Um, good and bad yeah. um, can be uh, uh, in the sports world is the Vancouver Canucks. So it was. It's not like it's a business. It's not going anywhere. It's here to stay. Um, and if you do it right, what's what's really ex I, I, I the the one thing I love about the Canucks is that it, it if it's done right, the the team can be the greatest ambassador the city has yeah. on an, on a consistent, ongoing basis. So. Having the players go out into another city and to see the jerseys start to appear in the other team buildings and to hear, you know, the complaints that uh, we used to hear, oh, for God's sakes, here come the Toronto Maple Leafs. When you hear that in Phoenix, and, oh, God, the Canucks are coming to town. That the kind of thing is kind of exciting to see as, a, as it's a, a, a measure of your team and your city and your, and your respect almost. And uh, so it was, it was one of those decisions and one of those... Uh, uh, very, very, obviously very, very um, fortunate um, parts of my life was to be part of something that was, uh, you know, identified with your city globally. Yeah. It's a huge legacy piece, I think, for you and your family. I mean, uh, when, when somebody mentions your name, uh, the Canucks is something that comes up right away. Um, how do you choose when you have something so big and that's your business, everyone knows you for that, that's your clout? And you sell it. You're under this high, like everyone knows me. I'm walking down the street. Um, you know, what do you do next? Um, to be honest, I'd be really honest with everybody in this room that 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 was a uh, that that was a uh, interesting experience for me because of not only w who uh, uh, had a different view or la la let me put it another way, um, there wasn't quite the same kind of. Um, awareness and I was thrilled. Um, there were times when um, people misunderstood yeah. why or what it was being involved in the Canucks for me. It wasn't, uh, I was a go-to person because one, it was my money and two, it was, it was, uh, ident I was, it was my job. 
Um, so people would come to me and ask me certain questions. It was difficult, though, ultimately, to think about what next, because I do like a challenge. And uh, uh, whether it was the Grizzlies, the Canucks, uh, GM Place, um, and it didn't take very long for a challenge to come along, and yeah. uh, and one that I could truly sink my teeth into again. And I'm so blessed I got the opportunity, and I was approached by. Uh, Tourism Vancouver. Yeah. Um, Tourism Vancouver uh, current CEO Rick Antonson said to me, uh, "Come, can you meet me from my office one day?" And this was yeah. this was about t December of '98 or '99. I should remember. Um, that just says I'm getting old. So I remember getting into his going to his office, and he says, well, "One of his colleagues comes in, he sits down, and then the that time the head of the." The chairman of Tourism Vancouver came into the Mark Mark Andrew, sat down and he says to me, uh, "So we think it's time for Vancouver to bid for the 2010 Olympic Games." I said, oh, "I think you're right." Yeah. Basically, sitting looking out at those mountains, sure. and they were just as dry as that. And I go, <laughs> and it was and it was like, "Oh gosh." Um, and then I said, uh, well, "Yeah, what do you think?" And he said, "Well, we'd like you to be the chairman of this, yeah. to be created committee." Um, and I said, all right, uh, what does that really mean? And so it really meant the following, uh, build a business plan, bring in the stakeholders, okay. create the board, and then sell it to the Canadian Olympic Committee, who ultimately decides whether you are the best city to go international. Uh, it would be great if there were so many uh, hurdles to overcome, as, as anything worthwhile in this world yeah. there are. And the hurdles were the simple ones. Um, there was. It was convincing uh, the members of the Canadian Olympic Committee, which are made up of winter and sport bodies, uh, representatives. Um, at the time, I think there were 78 of them. And uh, we, uh, we crisscrossed this country. We created a very good plan, and much of, it, much of which was uh, ultimately what, it, what was built and where. And so uh, that was my next uh, ride, if you will. And I can't tell you that there was many days that I didn't think I was the luckiest guy in Canada. Yeah. Because it wasn't just a Vancouver story, it was a Canadian story. The Olympics, we really won a huge, like, I remember waiting for that announcement. Yeah. You must have been. My there, yeah. Well, yeah, so my role actually was, wasn't, wasn't was the whole ride. Okay. I probably wouldn't be sitting here if it was. Um, I might, might be in a loony bin. But um, I ended up, uh, I ended up uh, being there for three years as the chairman, um, which was the domestic bid, which we won. We beat Calgary and Quebec. Love doing that. Always have. Uh, and then uh, the next, uh, the next piece of that was. Uh, I just hope Quebec gets a hockey team again. I, uh, just so we can beat them. Um, yeah. <laughs> but then I, uh, I, I think what, uh, what was the most uh, fun was afterwards, because we were, we won. And then they said the Canadian Olympic Committee said, hold on, don't tell anybody. Do not go and tell the uh, International Olympic Committee that you're in the marketplace. I said, well, why? He said, well, Toronto was bidding for what became the Beijing Olympics. And I said, how do you do that? I mean, how are we going to do that? And they said, well, you just have to go quiet. You're just going to have to sit back and do not promote. And I said, well. Is that hard for you? <laughs> <laughs> Tongue in cheek, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I had a few trips to Europe that were pleasure, and <laughs> there happened to be sporting events they, on. They, they sent you out of the country. It was to a be bobsled. Quiet. Oh yeah, my God! Yeah. It was a downhill. Yeah, oh wow! Yeah. Um, oh gosh, speed skating. Um, they just happened to be in the town I was in. Yeah. Yeah. When, so we <laughs> kept low key. And and the, oh wow. <laughs> Do you find that you know when you see examples of um, potential business opportunities? We have a lot of entrepreneurs here. When you see big opportunities that your influence to bring in money, to bring the right teams together, um, is somewhat of an advantage. Mm -hmm. And talk about putting the right people together for a, a project. How do you, how do you, who, like, you know, we, you know, you know a lot of people, and a lot of people know you, and uh, the cloud of, and, and the recognition of some of the people that you know are accessible to you because of who you are. So a lot of us have interesting networks. Who do you bring into your, to your sandbox? Who do you bring into your team to make sure you're an ace and you're going to get that bid? You're going to get that, you know, you're going to sell that team. Like, I mean, a lot of us don't, don't work at that level, but we want to bring it down to basics here. How do you pick your team? 
I guess the first thing I try to do is figure out what I can do, mm -hmm. uh, what I do and what I don't do well. Um, uh, and uh, for those who know me, there's that's that's there's quite a lot of things available there. <laughs> Um, there's, so I, I, I've always tried to surround myself, whether it be in the decision-making process, whether it be in a, um, with a, uh, um, uh, a business investment, um, a public venture, a, a, a charitable organization, a cause, is to try to surround yourself with people who compliment you. Um, that doesn't mean that they agree with you, it just means they compliment you. So um, I think I learned that uh, from, I, I think I observed that and watched that with my father. Um, even though he was a brilliant uh, entrepreneur, he was one of the most understated people you'll ever meet. He could wow. n would never have done something like this because it just wasn't what he did. But you want to sit down with him for an hour one-on-one, -on -one, you'll get a story that will go on and on and on that will be fascinating because it, it's very clear in his head what he did and didn't do. Yeah. Uh, and yet at the same time, I figured that my key was to be able to do a little bit like him. It was to surround myself with good people. Um, you know, I articulate your vision, if you will. So whether it be GM Place and yeah. selling that, the Grizzlies selling that, uh, the Olympics, uh, it's all been about that and it's also been about trying to bring people to the table. And I think if I look back at my life in the business sense especially, and you know, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm not helping if I am, but in, in this context, but if I look at where the people are that I've worked with in my career, whether it be sports, Olympics, or any of it, I, I, I just I couldn't be happier sitting here today to talk about those people. Yeah. They're working for yeah. There's Two of them are in the chief executive office of Jimmy Patterson. Um, uh, um, uh, one of them just, just left the NBA. Of course, we all know what Pat Quinn has done in his life. Sure. Um, uh, 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 you know, the, the, there is uh, one of my one of the presidents of the uh, the Canuck organization used to be called Orca Bay. You know, he yeah. became the CEO and chairman of a company, small company in the United States called Nextel, yeah. uh, which eventually, wow. after ten years, sold for forty billion dollars. Right. Absolutely, one of the nicest people on the planet. I mean, those are people that I've been very, very, very fortunate to surround myself with. Um, it's surprising we made any mistakes, but maybe that's because I got involved, I don't know, or interfered, but uh, anyhow, it was a, it's very, very lucky to be able to put, look around at where people are today and think, wow, amazing. There is something that I'm very, uh, you know, I, all, all the business side is very impressive, um, but there's, uh, again, I, my, my work is about legacy and people. Um, something that you did that, that is long-standing and a big community piece, which is Connect Place, and I want to talk about that. Um, that story uh, started. Uh, it's 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 as though I needed another job, I guess, or another opportunity, or something at the time. But in about 1992, um, got a phone call from one of Vancouver's really legendary uh, marketing gurus. He had an agency in Vancouver. You've probably heard of Frank Palmer, some of you. Well, his one of his partners was a, guy, a fellow by the name of. Uh, um, George Jarvis, who used to be called Palmer Jarvis. Yeah. So George came to me um, as he would in a very casual manner and he said, I want to bring you, a, I'd like to introduce you to this young lady. Um, and she is a uh, nurse. And I said, oh, great. So she comes into my office, she brings her Tupperware full of cookies and, and my assistant said to me, uh, well, would you like coffee? And she says, well, I'll have tea. So she's diminutive. Um, I can get away with saying that. And she, uh, she brought in the, we sat and had cookies and tea. She says to me, now, talk about off guard. Because I thought, well, she's, you know, she's just a sweet lady. Um, and she says to me, um, you know, I've got this idea. Um, I'm an oncology nurse at Children's Hospital in Vancouver, and um, I'd like to build, I have a vision to build a hospice for children. So, I said, well, what's that look like? And she says, but it has to be freestanding. Wow. I said, I'm not sure what, what you're really saying here, but she says to me, we'd, we'd like your support. I'm now building GM Place, just about to get a basketball team. No big deal. Uh, in fact, the, I think I had just done the deal to buy, to, build the, to, to buy the land to build the building around that time. So it was a very, very tight time frame. In fact, we were all in a small little office in the Marine Building. And long story short, I said, um, well, let me, let me think about this. And I'm like, I, I, so I got 
the material. I sat there for a while after she left, and I started to read it. And I looked around, I think I'm hospice for children. And then she, then she did, uh, she came back the next day, and she says, Arthur, uh, I asked her to come back the next day, and I said, what would you, what, would, what do you think? And I said, we'll do it. And she goes, write a check? And I said, no, no, we're going to do it. She goes, what do you mean you're going to do it? I said, well, we will find the location, we will find the money, and we will build it. She's like, she just started to cry. She just started to weep. And she didn't, I don't think I've ever seen her cry. And given what she does for a living, I, I, I don't think many people would, would be able to say that. So uh, we set about finding the location. We looked at various places, and we thought about building from ground, ground up. And she said, because I, at that time I had uh, three children, and I couldn't imagine, still can't imagine anybody going through um, the loss of a child. Um, so that said, we set out and we put the game plan together and with George and many yeah. other people and uh, media partners, uh, law firms, accounting firms, people put on golf tournaments still to this day all across this province, in fact. And, and it is a provincial um, even though it's the Vancouver Canucks and you think of Vancouver, it's in Shaughnessy, of course. There's a new one opening. There's a second one opening in Abbotsford um, very soon. And, um, and it just came like that. So Canuck plays two almost, if you will. Uh, so it's an extraordinary experience if you haven't heard about it, haven't seen it. But um, it's not almost... It is more than... Uh, a hospice for children because what it does is it allows people who have children who are uh, sick obviously respite care palliative care understand what a hospice is but secondly most most importantly I think at the end of the day uh, you have to deal with the fact that they will die and when they do what comes from that is a whole slew of collateral um, damage people um, family members, students. You know, you've got a 10-year-old boy who's been going to school for five years and his classmates and whatnot. So there's this outreach program that brings people into this that allows you to grieve, be aware, and move on. And what, what ultimately happens is all of those people, not all, but many of them become volunteers. In fact, my, my eldest daughter is a volunteer at Connect Place right now, so uh, last night she would have been there, so it's a it's a great great cause and a great uh, great place to be a part of. And very fortunate to have worked with again so many great people that um, grabbed the passion and the, and the torch, if you will, and made it happen. It's and, and so it's it's not just an, and this is I had an earlier conversation with Arthur um, because I I mean having a child myself I, I you know I dread anything like that, but it's uh, it's a reality for many families. Um, it's called Connect Place, but it's also, it's not just a name. The players will go mm -hmm. there randomly, and you told me about that. They yeah. would just drop drop in, yeah. and you know, it's, it's not like, you know, um, they're, and they're, it's, it's like unannounced, and, and then that type of thing. But, but no matter what we say, you know, sports stars, television stars, interesting people that can brighten your day um, does make a big difference. And these guys, if you want to just talk a little yeah, bit about it, it, it's absolutely yeah. unique in sport. It is totally unique in sport that you can find a cause that the players um, in any sport will want to be part of without being asked. Not that they're selfish at all. I'm not saying that at all. It's just that sometimes the team has an idea of where they want them to be and they go. These players, um, since it's been open, will go there on their own count. Trevor Linden still drops in. Um, um, you know, even uh, uh, Marcus uh, Naslin, when he was, when after he came, left, he came back and he'd come in and drop in. Pavel Burry will go up there. Gino Ojic, the old timers, the, and the newer newer players, and uh, uh, Roberto. I think one of the one of the great uh, uh, great stories, because of course there's the players, and there's an identity there, and there's part of them. They get, they go there. They they go there on their own account, and they, there are events created for the players to come and. And, and the families to come and par picnics and parties and so there's always that but then on their own account but the one really global celebrity that goes there often uh, when he's in town um, unannounced he literally will get into a car by himself yeah. and he'll drive up there and he'll go in and he'll just entertain Robin Williams yeah. just out of the blue he heard about it from his publicist when he was in town 
I think he was doing uh, Jurassic Park, one of these, one of, not, uh, no, what's it called, um, thank you so much, when he did that, when he was doing that here, I guess, he, and then he's been doing it ever since, and, uh, you know, you just imagine this, this very naturally funny, which is what it is, there's a lot of, ener lot of energy in, the, in Canuck Place, it's not a doom and gloom at all, it's just children enjoying the life that they have for every minute they have it. It's brilliant. Um, so, sports, <laughs> um, media, um, giving back. Uh, what else does somebody do? But uh, let's talk politics. <laughs> we do know that uh, everyone know that uh, Arthur was in the politics uh, circles, and we'll allude to your new work as well later. But uh, talk about the political game, and then what interests you about that? And so, so someone who's a businessman and entrepreneur. Um, the politics, yeah. Did you? Were you? Yeah. Were you into? Like, what, what got you into that? I think the 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 um, the uh, hope that there is an opportunity for people who have a different perspective on what politicians should be. Um, not everybody uh, grows up wanting to be a politician, but a lot of people do, <laughs> and that's all we do, and that's all I've ever done. And that's fine. And I, you know, some of them are very successful at it. If 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 that was me, that's that's not me, of course. I just thought that there was an opportunity to bring a different perspective yeah. to politics from a background that's diverse. Um, and that's why I got involved. And that's why I loved what I was. I ran in uh, in uh, God, I can't believe it. It's five years ago. I ran in a by-election in the which was for the downtown Vancouver. The the, the what was called the. Uh, uh, well, downtown East, uh, West End, and uh, Burrard riding in a by election in uh, late October of 08 because the then sitting MLA resigned and ultimately ran for the uh, uh, federal conservative. So there was, a, there was the U.S. election for our friend uh, Mr. Obama, there was a city of election for Gregor, there was, two, there was two by elections simultaneously, and then in 09 there was a provincial election, but the by election I lost. But I spent about uh, nine months, thereabouts, working, walking the streets, and um, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure if the people thought I was, you know, um, looking for donations or not. But um, I, especially down, you know, downtown on Robson Street, you know, I wasn't the corner there. But I, I did. Uh, I what I learned also, which is interesting, was just working with uh, some of the, uh, you know, the smaller outfits in the downtown mm -hmm. uh, core who do amazing work, whether it be um, uh, West End Seniors Association, some of these, uh, um, uh, the um, Davy Street organizations, of course, the uh, downtown, uh, the gay and lesbian community. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable, unbelievable. I mean, with, with one of those groups, it's, you know, your liver gets a pounding. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but I, you know, I even, I, even had a, I even had a car, if you want to call it that, in the Pride Parade in, uh, would have been 08. I was in the Pride Parade once. Oh my God! It we'll was talk a blast. About that. Yeah. It was such a blast. It's crazy times. Yeah, it was so it's much a good fun party. and great fun. I made, made some great yeah. friends, yeah. and so it was always just an idea that in politics there was an opportunity to bring, you know, when somebody says, you know, the Minister of Finance, um, not saying this is the case, but if potentially Minister of Finance, the Minister of Health, typically they're trying to find a doctor. The Minister of Finance probably never owned a business; yeah. they're just a political. I don't know. Use that terrible word, just, but that's what they've done their whole life in politics, and that—that's a shame because when you're running a, the, the, you know, the largest bu budget or the overseeing the largest budget, it's nice to know that person's actually run, and probably, hopefully, put some of their money at risk, and hopefully lost some of it, because that's the best way to learn. Learning. Do you, uh, of all the things that you've done, um, family involvement? Let's talk about your kids and. Uh, like you're, you're, you ran in from a family business to uh, always, you know, your family has a lot of, uh, a lot of history in the city. Um, what's the future for your kids? And are they involved in your businesses? Do you get them involved? You know, I've, I've met, I've met some of your kids. Yeah, and, yeah. So, I think yeah. some of them uh, will in the, in the, in the future. But for now, they've all, they've really enjoyed uh, um, credit to them, uh, finding their own way. Um, you know, they've enjoyed. Uh, um, doing what it is that they like instead of what I might be doing. There's no nepotism going on. Not at on all. There no. Like, um, yeah. I, I, I would think, though, 
truth be known, if they're still owning the Canucks, there might be a few people working there that yeah. had the same last name. Um, but otherwise, uh, no, they're enjoying, uh, they're um, making their own way. I was telling Viz earlier that my eldest son lived and worked with me in London, um, um, but he worked at a hotel over there, and um, thankfully he's now um, working in the Hotel Vancouver. That's right. He's the uh, manager of uh, right. 900 West, and then my second son is uh, going back to school, but he wants to be in commercial real estate, and he works as a day job. My daughter's, she's my young, my eldest daughter's just started her own organization. It's a charity called Backpack Buddies, and she's gotten so passionate about that. She almost, I said, what about a different job, like a job? And she goes, mm -hmm. Dad, no. I was like, got it. <laughs> yeah. It sounded like my. Sounded like your mother. Um, <laughs> and uh, and then my youngest son is graduating from, uh, uh, from my first marriage. He's graduating from uh, uh, London, Ontario this year. So then my uh, I have a ten-year-old daughter as well. Is it hard to maintain personal relationships while you're such a public person? Like you know the closeness. Like uh, everyone knows Arthur is the uh, owner of the Canucks. Everyone knows Arthur is this guy who ran for politics. You are very you are very approachable. Like if I like you know I seen you walking by me. On the street, and you're, 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 like you are, you're a man of the people. You're not hiding behind this big desk in this office and not approachable. You're like, do you have to like, do you have a separation, or are you, or this is this is your life? Like, um, that's actually interesting because I can probably summarize it this way. Um, it it uh, it is it is who I am. I've never I've never not been that way from probably the day I was born. I've been very. Uh, Maybe some say life in the party on occasion, <laughs> um, but honestly, uh, that's I enjoy that. Yeah. What I did uh, recognize that there was a bit of a oh gosh, a toll, if you will. There was a bit of a time when I was like, oh gosh, even my kids will say to me, Dad, my, my youngest daughter's ten. She goes, Dad, you know, do you think we could just walk to the classroom without you stopping, saying hello to everybody? She'll tell me right out, and I go. Got it, got it, got it. I, I don't know what that feels like at all. <laughs> you know, she's yeah. just crazy. She'll tell me whatever. And um, so I, when I lived in London, and I'll tell you this is exactly what I said to people, it was really nice to live in London and be known as Arthur. Yeah. I don't, for one minute, want you to think that I'm not grateful and respectful of Arthur Griffiths, but it's nice to be known as being Arthur. And I've got some, uh, one of the, some, wonderful friends, dear friends, great friends that um, I'd stay very close in touch with uh, in uh, London now and, and they could care less. Um, they've done their Google search and their Wikipedia by now. Yeah. But uh, yeah, there you go. Do you miss Europe? Do you miss the oh. whole feel? London's the, such a wonderful city. I do, I do very much. Um, Second home then for you? Absolutely. Yeah. But, but thank you for providing this summer. Um, because this certainly has made it much easier. Um, yeah. uh, but London was great. Uh, from a whole bunch of perspectives, it was that uh, what I just mentioned, but also, uh, I mean, the food, the culture, the history, the people. The, uh, of course, I, I, I maybe, I mean, I, the expression, Shirley MacLaine, you know, she's lived several lives. And I remember, and it's truth, I remember going down parts of London and thinking, I've been here. I'm not sure if there was a big fire or if there was a bombing or something, but yeah. I've been here. Yeah. It was that, uh, there was parts of me that think, oh my gosh, I've been here before. Because wow. it's that very, very, within a week, and I'm there, this is home for my whole life has been my home. So within a week, I felt like this was home, was London. So I'm, I enjoyed it. But having me, being, coming back and coming back with a new energy, more importantly, a new view and a new opportunities, I thought this is, uh, this is, this is where it's at. Let's talk new opportunities, and let's talk today. Um, what are you working on? You've, I mean, you're, you're, I, we all know that Arthur's working on something, for sure, because uh, <laughs> you can't stop this guy. But even more so, uh, I, I mean, I'm familiar with some of your work, but expand on uh, some of the things that you are doing. Yeah. Well, uh, and, and, and interestingly, when I moved back, I, I was thinking, oh, this is such, this is going to be really a tough grind to try to find something that's going to grab me again. Uh, I've been working for Russians for, for the last five years, and um, boy, they can grab you too. So I mean, I was uh, as we've seen I recently. Was, <laughs> I was in very. Uh, <laughs> I was working very hard for these people, and I enjoyed what I was doing and was respected. And but they're not all like that. But anyhow, that was my uh, that was my journey. But 
when I when I moved back, I thought, oh gosh, what am I going to do? And I mean, I so I kind of talked to people, started meeting people again, and and then one of my political uh, advisors on my campaign actually, we used to work for the MLA in Vancouver, um, downtown Vancouver. His name is Craig Jangula. So Craig and I are sitting at what I think might be. You know, as I mentioned earlier, business used to be done at the Vancouver Club or in a golf course. Well, Vancouver's got a new way of doing business, right? Can anybody say 49th Parallel or Artigiano or yeah. Starbucks? Well, 49th Parallel, that's where I sat down with Craig one day. Too. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. He says to me, you know, you're sitting there, and then the former MLA uh, sits there, and he's sitting with us, and we're having coffee, and he goes, you guys should do a consulting business in government relations. And I thought... Yeah, we should. So that's what we're doing. We have six clients in the last seven or eight weeks. Wow. And it's just a blast because they're all different. They all do different things. They all come about it differently. And um, so it's, it's kind of my personality. I can, uh, you know, um, hap fortunately, and my, my liver might, and my doctor might tell me something differently, but two of them are in the alcohol business and transportation and uh, media. Um, yeah. So I've got these uh, wide array uh, of clients, and I'm loving that. However, I have um, a very good friend of ours yes. um, has been um, talking to me about uh, uh, helping with him in the in a development sense, and it's a revolutionary business that uh, opportunity. And if you think about what makes you excited every day, and what makes me excited every day, it's changing lives, right. Cha making a difference. So this friend of mine has a company called PMI. It is early detection of cancer. Um, it is uh, proven technology and science detects four versions of cancer: uh, a bladder, oral, lung, and cervical cancer. It's easy, inexpensive test. Um, it's you. It's available here, but it's not fully endorsed in this province. And yet, it was founded here by two legends, giants in the Canadian and the Vancouver scene, uh, Dr. Ricks. And Milton Wong. That's right. These, this, these were so. Um, the now here and now is a recognition that this is too good to just try to focus on Vancouver or even Canada. This belongs and needs to be in the world. So I'm working with uh, this friend Bob Rye yeah. and, and the investors and some of the others in this room that we're looking at uh, making sure that it gets into the markets as quickly as possible. As I said, save lives, save cost. The test is amazing. It's just amazing because what it can do, not only will, will it detect the cancer, but it will tell you what stage you're at, zero to four, and no false positives. So historically, as we all maybe know, cancer can give you a false positive. By the time you get the test result, and it might be false positive, somebody says, wow, I think I need to get a, I need to go, maybe you should go a second opinion. Well, this is the final. Right. This will tell you. And then you go from there, and then you decide what you need to do or don't do. I, I, I can't, I can't be more excited about the future, to be honest with you. So I may be uh, shifting gears, as they say. I have to say, and everybody who's an entrepreneur in here, I've started a business, is starting a business, thinking about starting a business. You know that first feeling that you have, and it's a little bit of excitement, things are going well, a little bit of trepidation, all those things. I'm sitting here with a legendary person in business, and it's, it's, there's, no, there's no dispute about that. But it's so interesting and so refreshing and so cool for me, because I'm an entrepreneur myself, to hear you so excited again about a new business. Mm -hmm. And you're like telling us, oh, that's, I'm doing this, I'm doing this mm -hmm. project right here. Traditionally, we don't hear that from people of your background, your clout. Um, and uh, some people are very happy with just saying, OK, I'm done. I'm going to go chill out. I'm going to go up mm -hmm. some island every month. and. And enjoy uh, enjoy life, and uh, you know, you're like working. All, like I know you. I've like we hung out, and I'm sitting there, and you're you're on it. Um, how do you how do you how do you keep enthusiastic? Uh, well, as I said, about, I, it's, it's always new. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it doesn't have to be new. It has to be just uh, it has to it has to pull the right strings, and um, and uh, you know, sport was easy um, in that sense. It's it's easy for all of us to sort of kind of more or less relate to. <laughs> getting excited about sports and to be in the position that I was in was even more exciting. I mean, um, but to be able to, to, to look at your life and where you're at and think, oh my goodness, I, I could actually help this business yeah. go into a country, establish their roots, and at the end of the day, save lives? 
and money for a, for a country, for an individual, for otherwise. I'm like, where do you sign up? Well, so what? And then I have to, I have to sort of interject there. It's, there's some business people that don't think like that. They think like, what's in it for me? Where's my final buck? And I'm just gonna. I need to be there. And if I'm not there, then I'm out. And you're now thinking like bigger. Like that is. I, I think that is so refreshing to see that 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 type of business is happening in our community. Uh, gentlemen like Arthur is doing that, and you know, like I I want I want I want to be like that. I want to learn like that, and I want I want to make sure that uh, my kids and and their kids are thinking like that too, because that's that's unselfish. And I mean, and, and, and don't get me wrong, you've done some really great things in your life, and you've. Some people might say Martha doesn't have to work, doesn't have to do all this stuff, so everything's a bonus. But you're actually wanting to like keep doing this, so no. it's, it's it's amazing. It's amazing. It, 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 it's 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 true. And I and I when I when people ask me, including my kids, Dad, you know, when, so when my daughter bounces back and says, uh, you know, her charity, and I said, okay, got it. This is what she wants to do, and I'm like, okay, well, at least you're you're pretty clear and you're pretty emphatic. And and in my case, I've always been that way. I think in, in many ways, and some some good and bad decisions in business I've made have been uh, all predicated on um, on, uh, on, a, um, on, on what I what I can get excited about and if I didn't do that I wouldn't I wouldn't be here I wouldn't I wouldn't want to be here I wouldn't want to do it's all about you know doing something I'd love to yeah. do and you know and also recognizing that there are things that I'd love to do but I'm not good at it or I don't fit right, or it's not, uh, it doesn't, it, there's some boxes that aren't being ticked. So frankly, um, and I've learned, as I said, I've learned from lots of mistakes. Sounds like it. There lots <laughs> of mistakes, and at the end of the day, uh, the, the worst mistake you can do is repeat the first one. So um, in my dialogues, I, I, um, I work digitally, so I interview people uh, in front of a camera, and I, um, I get a chance to just ask them every question on my mind. Um, what we are able to do here today and in interactions like this is that um, there's, a re there's not just a reason for you to be staring at us and, as our conversation goes. Um, there's a portion for me to allow you to actually ask questions that you want to ask to Arthur. And I think uh, I want to take that time uh, to allow everyone to ask the questions that you've been thinking of that, that maybe before you got here, while you're listening to us. And you know, we, we have a lot of amazing, interesting people that I know in this audience. Some I've interviewed before, some I will interview in the future, and some are, uh, some are just amazing people that I've worked with. So any questions for Arthur out there? Mike, hey, please, Mike. yeah. Sure. Um, yeah. sure. Your, uh, your feelings are sort of, I guess, sort of going <coughs> into November 2nd. Uh, what's going to happen that day? For a lot of us, it's kind of been stalled. I'd love to hear your take. Well, I've actually, I've actually been in touch with uh, the Russian rocket a few times in the last few days because right. um, um, the story that goes with that and that, that that the recognition that he's receiving from the Canucks and that he's received from the hockey world in the last couple of years in terms of the uh, inductions into the Hall of Fame That's right. um, are not only deserved and to, un to understand one thing to understand he came from a culture in a country and in a family that that, that was uh, just part of the new world you know it was he was just in that cusp of Russia being uh, theoretically not communist, <laughs> at least not con dictator. Um, anyhow, he, so he was quite careful and quite shy and reserved in public, in this setting, in the world. Um, obviously, um, you don't have a two-type personality because when you saw him on the ice, yeah. he was more than happy to be entertained or entertain or be part of the party or be sh part of the show. Given what he did for a living, so I am so excited, and I I can't uh, uh, tell you that when you get because to, to to know Pavel the way I do um, was is a treat, because I saw someone who was so dedicated to being the athlete that he was, the training he went through, and it came naturally, and it also came because his father made him do it. His father was a a, a, a seven-time Olympic medalist um, for Russia. Uh, he was a swimmer. Um, his most famous Olympics was finishing five times, uh, uh, five silvers behind Mark Spitz in Munich. So, but he was, so Pavel was probably one of the most physically strong players I ever saw, particularly in those days. Just that people didn't, weren't built like that. He was a machine. He would go to the gym two hours. He would <coughs> practice for an hour, hour and a half. He'd go to the gym for two hours. And then he'd probably go for a swim or play tennis. That's just who he was. And uh, then to see him socially, and I see him, in, I've seen him in Moscow a few times in London, and so on, and 
I, I'm really excited for him, and uh, and he's you know he's uh, he's married now, and his uh, mother is you know. When I saw them, I surprised them. I went to Moscow in uh, um, last year, and I went to Moscow as a uh, guest to a, see a Reach Bible hockey game of 30 years prior, 1972. So I go to this hockey game, and nobody knew I was coming. So on the ice, this 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 hockey game, there were 14 ex Vancouver Canucks: Howell, McGilvy, um, uh, Tikkanen, uh, some of these great old Canucks. And, Anyhow, when I saw Pavel, like, I don't think I, you'd think that I scored the goal, the way he embraced me, and it was so cool, and he's a great, he's a really cool guy, so uh, I think he, he, when you get him away from the rink and you get to have a, you know, maybe probably, in my case, vodka, not his, but like beer, uh, vodka, uh, a maybe a slip, slip and roll there, but that's what happens. So he's a very fun guy, and he's, a, and he's still a machine. Actually, that hockey game he had uh, six points, uh, out of a possible seven. Yeah. yeah, I think McGill only had five out of seven. <laughs> Neil. Yeah. You're uh, you're well known all over the city, and uh, you're very successful along the road. Do you have any mentors or people? Because sometimes yeah. you know, when you're in that. Absolutely. How do you how do you make this? <laughs> well, obviously my father, um, and sadly um, my father. Um, uh, died uh, too young. Um, uh, my father uh, died 20 years ago, um, but uh, he was one of clearly one of my mentors. Jimmy Patterson, uh, Joe Siegel, um, two uh, two people that uh, I really really um, respected and would literally go and call them up when there was some decision, whether it was politics, Olympics, or otherwise, and say, "What do you think?" Yeah. And I would go and have coffee with them, and that's uh, and they, they were always full of. Basic questions. I think Joe Siegel is probably a savant in that business yeah. in terms of advice. But my father was was pretty black and white, and I guess that would make sense being an accountant. But he was able to go right through there and say, "This is what you should do," and or "This is what you should think about before you do it." And um, so, yeah, those were the three people that would come to mind. My mother, to be honest with you, and and actually, I, I know that that everyone, mother, son, whatever, absolutely, she's as smart as a whip, and still is, and she will. She is. Uh, she's. She's pretty quick to give advice, and uh, and uh, and it's usually right. Awesome. Um, we'll go Vikram, and then we'll go Robin, and then we'll go over to you after, please. So, at what point did you make a decision to say, "Okay, I'm done with Canucks. I'm done with Grizzlies." And did that feel as a failure? Because if, start, if something that you've started with so much passion and you fought the city and fought the, you know, the, the public basically. To bring it to that level, and the second question is: Do you ever feel now that the Canucks are making a shitload of money? Yeah. Uh, that you should have been part of that organization. There's an entrepreneurial businessman That's right. that knows exactly what I went through. Uh, yeah, I cried. I cried a lot. Um, it was tough. Um, I think it was tough, um, obviously because it's very visible. Um, but it was my heart and soul is what I did. Uh, it's, I I became too defined by it as it turns out. I think. Um, um, I just wanted to win. I wanted, I wanted um, to say that we won the Stanley Cup. I wanted that in the worst possible way. Um, but it was killing me financially. Um, wow. And I remember, um, I remember calling my, um, my mother. Um, my father had passed away by this point. And my mother, I said, Mom, I, I've made the decision. I have to sell. And I, and I called her in the early days of a mobile phone. And I said to her this, and she said, good for you. Your father would have done it a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> you know, she allowed you to learn that. Gained, I gained some sense of humor yeah. uh, that she would yeah. bring to a, a conversation. So I, I, uh, I, it made me feel good, but at the same time, I, I knew it was the right decision, but it was a difficult one for sure. And then, and then ultimately, um, um, seeing um, the team do well uh, now financially is it's bittersweet, of course, uh, but the reality is, um, you know, the foundation is there. The team is here. The team was here because of a difficult time. Um, um, you know, in the 90s, there was one team in hockey in Canada that did not sell. And it was the Calgary Flames. Every other team, two left because of the economy, the economics, and uh, the other uh, four teams um, sold. Um, so, uh, you know, Vancouver. Uh, it was just one of the casualties, and whatever 
I can say about it is that I've got a pretty good story about how it came about, what we did and what we didn't do, um, what we tried to survive through. So I, uh, yeah, it was a emotional time, but uh, I look back on it and go, how many people can say I did what I did? And I'm pretty excited and proud of that. Robin, did you have a question? Yeah, yeah so Vikram kind of set up my question uh, just through what you're saying. As an entrepreneur, you start up and, and exit a lot of businesses. When do you know to get out of something that's struggling or just not going to make it? How do you go about that process of making that decision? Just like you were just starting to get into knowing that yeah, I have to exit this. But how do you, and, and how did you do it then and how, how do you do it now? Do it now differently than then. Um, to be honest with you, I would have probably sold the Connect sooner. Uh, because it was bleeding me dry. It was just an absolutely, um, I had, when the problem I had, um, in the, the inner workings of a relationship which I had with my partner in business at that time was John McCaw. The challenge I had was he was able to fund, because he was a billionaire, he was able to fund the losses with bank loans, cash, whatever, cash. I wasn't. So I was in a very unenviable position that if I didn't fund, and he did, he acquired more of the business as a result. So that's how he acquired. Ultimately, I went from 80% down to 20, very quickly. And so, what I wouldn't, what I want, what I did have, I did. My lawyers did my best to protect me in the beginning when I had my partnership agreement. They put in the clause that said if I could find partners to come in, become my partner, if you will, to shoulder the the burden, um, that I could. But his side said, fine, but if you, if you do, I have the right to veto the partnership that you might bring in. So essentially I had no way to get a partner in or no way to bring in other people to, to ride out the wave. Um, so I guess I can say to you is that I would have sold earlier because of the partnership agreement I had, um, but what I was really gaming for and aiming for was to create essentially a public entity. You know, because I think at the time the Canucks, the Grizzlies and the building as a financial entity could have actually received, you know, could have been an interesting IPO. Um, and I wanted to try to do that, but I, my partner wouldn't let me. So I was, I was uh, watching it slip away slowly. Uh, right over here, yeah. Um, you mentioned that you've made a lot of mistakes mm -hmm. in your career. Um, you just gave one, one example of yep. um What other mistakes have you made in your career that you learned from? And was one of them Mike Keenan? I, I can I can be so, so happy to tell you I had nothing to do with Mike Keenan. You mean the hiring of him? Yeah. Yeah, I'm so happy to say I had nothing to do with that. And it's not because Mike isn't a good coach and Mike isn't a good person at all. It's just that I have a very simple philosophy with people, that, uh, particularly when it comes to people you, that work for you and work with you. Simple. Do not embarrass people in public. Yes. And coaches that do that, I have no time for. Wow. I am uh, managers that do that. I have no time Humans, for it. Yeah. It is just wrong, and I and so Mike was a, a, a decision that they decided they needed this kind of personality. They thought his record was, they didn't. They forgot that his winning record also doesn't last very long. And secondly, he's. I always used to think about Mike, and I, you know I think he's an interesting human being, but Mike is a Mike is an interesting study because he. He, he, he's, I think he's coached in every team in the NHL, some teams twice. So Mike is, uh, uh, yeah, so I had nothing to do with Mike. Um, that said, uh, Bill LaForge uh, was a coach that years ago, we had hired him for like three or four weeks. Um, 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 I was involved uh, as, a, you know, as the governor and chairman or CEO of when we traded Cam Neely. Um, not a, ultimately, as you look back, it was a terrible decision, but you thought you were doing one thing and it turns out you did something wrong, ultimately. Uh, player moves are difficult to assess in some ways. Um, um, it, it, so obviously the Canucks, Grizzlies, the structure was, uh, was, wasn't gonna work um, in, in an economic time that nobody could predict. Um, there was, we got the highest possible rating in New York for the debt financing on the Grizzlies in the building because, simply because, these assets were strong and people didn't think the economy was going to turtle, as it did, and especially sports, Canadian sports. So uh, it just it just came all at once. And then, uh, but I had a, um, hmm. 
What happened to that big country guy? <laughs> he is living back where he's from, Gans, Oklahoma. Yeah. Um, he is a, a demigod. He goes into the stadium there where the Oklahoma... It's because he's the tallest guy there. Yeah. <laughs> right? Uh, he, uh, like that. He, he's, he, he, I remember him. I, was, I couldn't understand oh. him sometimes in the interviews, but I, oh, I remember yeah. him. Uh, he was a big guy. He is a big guy. Yeah. He was uh, seven feet, I think, yeah. or seven one. Yeah. Um, Can I just follow up on Yeah, that? yeah please. Uh, yeah. Specifically on, on your, uh, you know, when you lost in, in politics, what was it that uh, that um, that you learned from that, or, or why do you think that happened? Well, it's virtually impossible to win in a by-election when you're the sitting party. So that was pretty much ordained. I wasn't planning to run in the by-election. I was planning to run in the provincial election in '09. I'd already declared I was going to run, so I'm now in the race. I did what I could. Um, turnout was ridiculous. I mean, turnout was like 23 percent. It's just ridiculous. So it was such a, a whole bunch of things. But in fact, I think I won. I ended. I ended up winning. I I didn't go to Victoria, but I ended up going to London, and I ended up working in the Vancouver Olympics. Oh, wow. Then working in London, I'm going. I am the winner, hands down. That's a great answer. I totally um, lucked out of that. I think. And uh, and today, I uh, the experiences I've had in London Olympics, the then the Russians. It's a it's a journey I won't forget or regret. Questions, yeah. Randy. And then Priya, and then I'll grab come to you, and then Safi at the end. What's your uh, view on Vancouver as a place to start a business, to do business, versus <coughs> some of the other places you've lived That's in? Great work. question. You know, the, this is kind of a lifestyle town that should be for a lot of people, uh, but a lot of people can be successful. It, versus, you know, young people that have opportunities yeah. that are global, London, New York, Moscow, wherever. Well, I definitely encourage anybody that has the chance, the opportunity, to go somewhere else. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. Do it. Um, almost anywhere. But certainly if you can do it in a place that you've got something that you can follow a dream or a passion, do it. Um, that said, uh, having lived here, gone there, come back, um, uh, Vancouver's pretty, pretty good at promoting being a big city on the global scene. It's not so much, <laughs> not so much. Um, that said, it's uh, a lifestyle, as you said. I think the one thing Vancouver's slowly starting to, to, to evolve out of um, is a place that people run public companies not, and, and people lose a lot of money. That's, that's been, I'd say, in most of my life, one of the biggest problems Vancouver's had on a financial sense. Um, but starting businesses, running cultures of businesses, you know, of course, we've got Lululemon, Aritzia, and the list goes on now, of course, Electronic Arts and others. They're, they're great, great uh, companies to be part of. And I think that, um, so there's a new, there's a new benchmark. Um, um, so I think there's a, uh, it's, it's, but, you know, it's, uh, I think that's the biggest thing for me is people look at Vancouver today and think, you know, there's more to life than just the job, and there's an opportunity to make money, and there's an opportunity to make money in a place like this. Priya in the back there, yeah. Um, I was actually curious about being in the next place and the nurse that you spoke to, and what it was about that time in your life that first was a big story that made you say, yes, I'm actually going to do something about this, and not just hear a good story. Uh, her name was Brenda, Brenda Eng, by the way. Um, and she's now a uh, se senior nurse at Washington University, Washington University, Washington, Washington Children's Hospital, sorry. Um, anyhow, um, what it was was, of course, having three children under the age of 10, first of all, and thinking, is this, does this happen? Like, come on, really? And I think the, uh, the fact is that what gave me additional drive She, um, after saying it, it's easy to say it, now you have to do it. Um, um, what uh, gave us the additional drive with, is if I needed something else to, to do, um, was that she introduced me to a little boy. Um, his name was Bryce, and Bryce Davidson. And she said to, and, and Trevor. And uh, she said, you know, you should meet him. And so this little personality was six years old. He came into my life. and. He became part of our family. I visited him and visited his family, and they were from Whitehorse. And they were staying at that time at Ronald McDonald House for treatment. And he obviously had cancer, 
Um, and I got this really, uh, he imparted a part of himself into me uh, that um, I'll never forget. And um, he was, he had more wisdom, courage, um, and almost like he was saying, don't, don't, don't give up. This is needed. And uh, so I think that was, between Brenda and Bryce, I was, I was done. It was going to happen. Wonderful. Um, right there. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. So um, my question is, what keeps you motivated? It's very easy to be motivated when things are going well. In the hard times, what is it that you do or, or you know, other than self belief you know, that's one thing that all the things have. But what keeps you motivated on a daily basis? My children. And my mother. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just just knowing that um, that there's a there's and it, it's it's a curse at times um, because it's um, you don't want to disappoint and you want to always make them proud and and I'm just built that way. So I, I think that's a big part of it. Um, when it's really dark and it's really ugly, um, I just break it down to the simplest things. I really uh, enjoy uh, I enjoy a, a nice meal. I like to cook. Um, so in terms of escape, that's uh, that's the best thing for me. Music. Um, occasionally watch a hockey game. Sure. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, yeah. My children is probably uh, you know there are, there are five five of them, and they're amazing uh, individuals as opposed to they're not. There's some similarities, but they're very interesting individuals and to see them grow up and see them in great relationships and and um, worry about me it's uh, pretty lucky. Awesome. Uh, Safi and then Mike in the end. Yeah, there we go, please. Um, so it's actually kind of following up from a couple of questions. It's really inspiring to hear and uh, just listening to you how you're able to take such a almost like a negative experience or like a bad decision and spin the positive. And I'm, I'm really curious actually about one of your worst days like the story behind that and what trade it was that got you through that so that you could find that wisdom. Oh, one of the worst days. Um, I may not be the biggest person in this room, in case anybody doubted that, um, but I hate to lose. I will not give up. I don't, I do not, do not doubt for a second that I'm competitive. Um, so when I uh, want to um, draw deep down into something that um, uh, that'll make me better, um, I always look at what the past has brought me, good and bad, and um, and what's most important and simple little things. Um, so I think I, I have to say that um, um, you know, as I say, the Canucks was not a not a good not a good time in that sense. But I knew it was the right decision, you know, because then you got the other decision, which is financial, and the same goes for same goes for um, m many other things in my life, the politics, as, as I said. Um, I got involved in a public company that was an absolute horror show, mm -hmm. absolute horror show. I wow. cannot believe um, I'm still standing. Um, and as I look back on it, I go, "Wow, how stupid could I be? I bought everything they were selling." And I'm still paying for it. And so I look back and I go, well, I can tell you this much, I'm not going to do that again. Um, pe people around me wouldn't let me for a start, and I won't do it anyhow. But So in some ways, I think it's just uh, trying to build from a, um, an inside belief that um, even today, I'm, you know, it's not always rosy right now. And I look around and I go, at least, at least I, can, uh, I can influence uh, my life. Whether I can influence others is to be determined, but at least I can do some about who I am, uh, what I believe in, uh, what I care about, and try to keep it uh, pretty straight and simple. Last question from Mike, and then we're going to wrap up. Um, yeah. What would be the top two books you'd recommend to uh, an entrepreneur to read? Books? Yeah. Oh gosh, obviously, good to great. Um, you know, there's a, uh, there's so many. I, frankly. I get more out of, well, Steve Jobs, you know, um, 
very, very good book. Um, if, you, if you've got a month to read it, uh, I recommend audio. Uh, but so I think I think uh, what I've Jim Patterson was one of these people, who obviously is not the book that you're going to read. What what you get from your mentor, and I did, is just listen carefully to their story, to listen to to them, and if they self-admit and they talk about the mistakes that they've made, that's what you want to listen for. I mean, it's all great to know that someone made six or seven or eight billion dollars, but what did they do? When, how did they get there is whatever, but when it was bad, when it was really ugly, when you, when you were losing money or when you were going to go bankrupt, that's when you get to know what, how these people are built and what they've done. So to me that was, uh, and, and those are books, are books are there, but I really enjoy just listening to, Joe Siegel is just, just an amazing human being. Amazing. What a story. There is a man that, that story should be on, on television. That's an amazing, amazing movies. I used to sit with Joe. Uh, Joe is one of my mentors as well. I used to sit with Joe in his office, and every month he would say to me, uh, I'll give you all my money if you give me all your youth, and he'll make it all back over again. And, he's, uh, and he like, would. And he would, yeah. <laughs> he would. Uh, amazing man. Yeah. Um, I, um, I, I first want to thank everyone uh, today uh, for coming. Uh, this first, honestly, this, this series uh, that I'm leading here of conversations is a dream for me, and I, I, love, I love every minute of it. And it's, uh, uh, it's a pleasure to, to interview and, and interact with such interesting people, uh, both right here and right here. Um, one, my work uh, recently, um, I graduated with my master's in, 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 in communications, and I did uh, my thesis on legacy. And I do ask this question of a lot of my subjects. I'm going to ask you today, um, how do you want to be remembered? What is your legacy that you want to be remembered for? Hmm. Good guy. Yeah. It's, it's always interesting for me to, 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 to sort of it's fascinating to me because I sometimes think I'm living someone when I, when I look back at my life and I look back at the Canucks and I look back at where people talk to me and they, they, they approach me and they go, wow, you actually, do you remember saying hello to me? Or I'm like, well, yeah, I do. Or maybe I don't. But point being is, is that they're shocked that I've actually take the time to talk to them. Like, That's right. who doesn't? Why would you not? And then, and for me, to me, my, 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 my enjoyment has been that interaction with everybody I meet. Um, not always pleasant, but for the most part, pretty good. And I'm, uh, I'm very fortunate that, uh, that I get a chance to uh, interact like tonight and, uh, and to be part of this, to be honest with you. It's been a really interesting experience for me because I'm living, reliving part of my life that, as I say, I feel like it wasn't even my life. I'm going, did that really? Did you do that? You were you were there. I'm sure we have videotapes somewhere. Yeah, of all those you you were there. Yeah. You were there in '94. You were there when they broke ground in GM Place. Yeah. I'll tell you a very very personal story that that I, I didn't think I'd ever be saying this publicly, but I the kind of person I am and the part and I mentioned the family and I only had four children at this time, but when GM Place was opening in '94, '95, um, in the summer of '94. Uh, they were pouring what's known as the slab, where the ice surface was. And I talked to the construction department, and I said, I'm going to come down from the office, which was across the street, more or less, up on Beatty Street. And I said, I'm going to come down, and I've got something that I'm going to put underneath center ice. This is before anyone decided to put a loony under an ice rink. But, so I took a picture of my children, and, I have, and my wife at the time, and I, you know, I said, the original dream team. And so this is a continuum pouring of slab that you cannot stop. If you stop, you get a ripple, and that's a problem. So I was, I was instructed to be there at a certain time, 15 minutes early. I walk out onto this wood strut, out on the floor. Concrete's coming, and I wait till it gets close, and I slip it underneath, concrete goes, and I walk off. And so uh, I presume, unless they've had to replace the floor, which they might have, it's still there. But uh, that's my... That's uh, an amazing story. Yeah. And the sign... So the picture is myself, my wife's holding... My youngest, who's now 22, and my um, and then and the others, and we're standing underneath the sign, Griffiths Way, yeah. outside the building, because it was after the '94 run, 
we took we had a big event at BC Place, and we took some photos. So that's the picture that's under the floor. Ladies and gentlemen, Arthur Griffith. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much.